Welcome to EDU 551, online learning module about technology ethics, the digital divide, and education, created and narrated by Alyssa Weedor. What is the digital divide? According to Ball, author of Addressing and Overcoming the Digital Divide in Schools, the digital divide is the existence of gaps in society between those who use technology and those who don't. In order to fully define the digital divide, it is important to look at the causes or reasons for the existence of this gap in society. One of the reasons for the gap is the unequal access to technology. The inequality of access includes one's ability to own technology as well as the ability to keep it up to date and working properly. This reason is driven by economics or a person's financial standing. Another reason for the gap could be a person's motivation to become involved in the digital world. If a person feels they have no need for technology, they will separate themselves from the digital world, therefore widening the gap. A third reason for the gap is one's ability to navigate current technology. People who do not have strong computer and technology skills will not be able to access technology to its fullest capabilities. This reason is driven by education as opposed to wealth or personal motivation. The early plan to bridge the divide. It was the goal of the government to overcome the digital divide by providing computers to all schools and people. In 1995, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration's NTIA was formed because the Clinton administration was interested to see whether internet access was being distributed freely and equally across America. President Clinton's call to action for American education initiatives required that all public schools and libraries be connected to the internet by 2000 and call for every household to be connected by 2007. It is clear that this goal was not achieved successfully. Later, the Bush administration downgraded the NTIA and cut funding, which effectively killed the organization. Bridging the digital divide, the effects cell phones have had on the gap. A 2011 study showed that 83% of adults living in America own a cell phone. Most cell phones today are able to access the internet. Of those owning cell phones, 51% of Hispanics, 46% of African Americans, and only 33% of whites use their cell phones to access the internet. The higher internet usage among Hispanics and African Americans can be misleading. It is thought that the higher usage among Hispanics and African Americans is because these groups are less likely to have other outlets to access the internet. What the digital divide has become and how it has changed since it was first coined in the early 1990s. Historically, the digital divide was all about ownership, the haves and have-nots of technology. Due to the continued price decrease and easier accessibility of digital devices, this has changed. Today, the digital divide is more about the variety and quality of access and the equality of one's ability to utilize the technology. The digital divide used to be driven by wealth. It is now driven by education, which only puts added pressure on schools and teachers to step up their technology game in order to level the current as well as future playing field. Currently, 95.6% of all Americans live within the coverage of at least one mobile broadband network. Multiple studies have been conducted looking at different facets of society, race, wealth, and education. In 2010, laptop ownership, as well as home broadband access, just about broke even between African Americans and whites in America. 56% of African American households reported having broadband access, compared to 67% of white households. In 2009, a study was done based on income levels, which showed a positive relationship between household incomes and home internet access. In 2007, a study was done based on education level. The study determined that the higher a person's education level was, the more likely they were to own a computer. The digital divide is no longer divided by just race or socioeconomic status. The two groups of people that are most affected by the digital divide are people who have a farming or rural background and those with disabilities. Think back to the beginning of this presentation. I stated two of the causes of the digital divide to be need and accessibility. It can be argued that people living in a rural area who depend on farming for a living 
have little need for computers and internet. Coupled with the access to internet heightens this group's vulnerability to fall behind the digital divide. People with disabilities are vulnerable for another reason. Currently, there are no laws stating that websites need to be accessible to people with disabilities. The accessibility of the internet for people with disabilities is creating a gap within the digital realm. There is a plethora of ideas from numerous researchers as to what will level the digital playing field. According to Bernard, the availability of digital devices themselves, along with improved digital navigation and basic literacy skills, are the three keys to diminishing the gap in society due to the digital divide. According to another researcher, Hertz, having schools and public libraries extend their hours for use of their computer labs will help bridge the digital divide. Ball, yet another researcher, thinks schools should create technology clubs that stay up to date with technology and train others within the school to increase technological comfort and accessibility. There are already programs currently in place that are trying to close the gap that exists in our society due to the digital realm. Comcast has invested in a reduced home internet package for families that receive free or reduced school lunches. The program is titled Internet Essentials and is available anywhere that Comcast service is provided. Due to the changes of the driving force behind the digital divide, schools are under more pressure to create equality among the digital world. The digital divide is now driven by inequality in education of digital devices as opposed to the inequalities in ownership of these devices. The question is not whether we can get an iPad into every kid's hand, it's whether communities can leverage the ca ca capacity of networks to make learning more authentic and powerful for students. Schools have to deal with proper technology education if they want to provide an equal opportunity for their students to receive a good education. According to Ball, there are four sequential levels of education digital divide that schools must address. Level 1 is all about the ability of schools to properly access computers and technology. Level 2 focuses on the skills and technological competencies of teachers and students. Level 3 deals with culture and policy and how those two can create issues in schools. Level 4 surrounds personal values, motivation, and choices of teachers. Ball believes that you cannot move from one level to the next without fully the digital divide once seen as a factor of wealth is now seen as a factor of education those who have the opportunity to learn technology skills are better positioned to obtain and make use of technology than those who do not nowadays it's possible that in one classroom there may be students from multiple socioeconomic groups you may have a student who you would consider to be part of the upper middle class who has a family that values travel and different cultures, as well as a handful of students who you would consider to be part of the lower middle class whose families value travel but don't have the means to make it possible. Can the internet, which is filled with videos, photographs, articles, and more, be an alternative to visiting other locations for those students that aren't able to travel as frequently? Can technology skills allow students and people to access information that otherwise they would not be able to access? Can technology become an equalizer rather than a divider?